celebrate God's gifts in our, in our all of you here with us this morning. <clears throat> uh, Pastor Jean is delayed for a few moments. She'll be with us shortly. She's just having to do with something that came up. Um, as we prepare for worship, as we begin our week, some prayer concerns that we want to lift up. We want to keep in, uh, in our prayers both uh, Alan Johnson and Joe Brown, both of whom have been hospitalized this past week. We also have two families who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Please keep uh, Scott and Stacy Mitchell and their family in their prayers on the death of Scott's uh, father, Bud. Uh, the funeral was held earlier this week. Um, and Cash, one of the Cash in the church is going to be a And uh, please also keep Chris Seeger, our church secretary, in your prayers. Uh, Chris's aunt died earlier this week, so she was kind of close to me, so um, she is grieving that loss. So please keep those families in your prayers. Our order for, uh, I should say also in our order for worship, please note that uh, the choir is singing the Kyrie and Hymn of Praise combination this morning, so we'll get to that point in our worship with the choir will lead us, and um, we'll move on to the prayer day following that. As you are comfortable, would you please rise as we begin the confession of that the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. You may be seated.
I can see your smiling faces. So have a seat. Well, I brought something with me this morning that I want to show you. You want to have in my pocket here. I have a $100 bill. Ooh, I know. <laughs>
Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he went and was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who has not received a hundredfold in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So last week, if you were here, you recall that Pastor Gene used the dreaded S word, stewardship. This is October. We typically talk stewardship in October. And that, of course, you know, gets people a little bit of a moment because stewardship is always thought of as, as money. We're talking about money. And money is a part of stewardship. But stewardship is not simply about money. It's not about your, your, your offering envelope and what you throw in the envelope and then throw into the plate. That's not what stewardship is. Stewardship is about our entire being. Stewardship is about my entire self. It's about recognizing that what I am, what I have, is all God's, and it's all God's gift to me, entrusted to me. And so stewardship then becomes not about the dollars, I mean it is about dollars, but it's about much more, it's about my whole sense, my whole, my whole personhood, and how I use what God has entrusted to me wisely as a disciple of Jesus. And that's why discipleship and stewardship are two sides of the same coin, no pun intended. That good stewards use what God has given to them and trusted to them wisely as God would have them use it. And they are therefore faithful disciples. And faithful disciples, almost by definition, are good stewards of the things that God has entrusted to them. So with that said, I want to tell you about our Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we had a lot of things going on. The, uh, the quilting ladies gathered um, and finished up their quilts that went to the boxcar yesterday morning to be shipped around the world. And um, later in the day, some of the after school kids got together and they, they, um, they worked on uh, school kits, uh, getting those that finally all done and assembled so they could go around the world. We had confirmation going on. We had handbells and we had a choir practice. We had a lot of things going on. But we had something else, and I want to share this with you right now.
part, that was part of our after school program. Uh, it's been kind of a neat thing this year. Um, we have a number of our sixth graders who, and there's our sixth graders who have their instruments and they bring them after school. And, and it, it, the Wednesdays have been nice enough that every Wednesday pretty much they've been out there right around quarter to four playing out on the street here. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping none of the neighbors have a night shift, you know, or trying to sleep at that time. <laughs> Just wild, incredible, wonderful stuff going on. And it can happen because there's a place for them to come. There's a place where they, they can kind of let loose and, and do some of those fun things, but also begin to build relationships and, and grow a little bit as, as disciples of Jesus in a small way. And that is a part of our stewardship as a congregation. Pastor Jean talked a little bit about that last week when we talked about children. Uh, the importance of nurturing them. And we're going to come back to them in a few minutes. We're going to come back to them. But, but as we think about that whole sense of stewardship, we also want to take a look and hear what the Word of God says. And so we have this marvelous story, what well, kind of marvelous story, in um, the Gospel of Mark today. It's about this rich young man who comes to Jesus. Now, the problem with this story is that for centuries, maybe even for 2,000 years, I don't know, Preachers have tried to figure out how to rationalize that story because it is a hard-hitting story. A man with wealth comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to, to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what, what does the law say? What the commandment say? He says, I've done everything. And Jesus says, you have one more thing to do. You've got to get rid of everything. And of course, he can't do it. When we read those story, that story and we say, well, now wait a minute. Well, 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 wait a second. I'm not ready to go that route. And so we rationalize it. That's about rich people. Rich people should do that, and I'm not rich. Or, that was 2,000 years ago. Things have changed. Or, we'll say, well, that was for people in Palestine, not for people here, not in West Salem. We find ways to rationalize the story. I want to suggest to you that we, we, we cannot rationalize that story, that that story hits us and it hits us hard, but maybe it hits us a little differently than we might imagine. Maybe it hits us in a different way than we might think. Maybe the way it hits us is that this is not a story about a defined moment in time where you either do it or you don't. Maybe it's more about a lifetime. About a lifetime. So um, there are three things that jump out at me in the story. The first thing is just the whole concept of stewardship. And we talked about that a few minutes ago uh, as I began. The rich young man comes with wealth. But that's not all there is to stewardship. Stewardship is about my very being. Stewardship is not simply about whether or not I write the check and empty out the bank account, which please don't do. Stewardship is I'm ready to turn over control of my life to the God who gave me my life to begin with. That's the issue for this rich young man. He's not willing, he's not willing to let go of some stuff. He wants to hang on to it. And don't we, don't we kind of do that? I mean, isn't this one of our primary things, our primary goals in life to have financial security? So I know that I'm taken care of. People like, wait a minute, that means I'm taking care of me. Right? If I got financial security, it's about me taking care of me. I remember as a child, when I was about 12 years old, and, and some of the kids have heard this story, so they'll go roll their eyes a little bit. But, um, I had, I had, I saved up my money to go on vacation. I saved up $75. Now back then, that was big bucks. And I went on vacation, and I came back, and you know what, what really, what, what really excited me was I came back with $69 of the $75, because I'm the notorious saver. So I was excited. I came back with all this money, $69, bucks, and I put it in a mason jar, sealed it with wax, stuck it way back in the closet, and then sealed it with wax in case my brother or sister were in, I'd know. And I stuck with it. And then I remember coming out and sitting at my desk in my bedroom and thinking, ah, I am rich. Do you know, I could even go downstairs right now and eat a whole bag of pretzels. And if my mother doesn't like it too bad, I could buy a replacement. I had control over my life, or at least I imagined. Stewardship is about learning that I don't have control over my life, that my life is not mine to control. And when I live in that illusion that I can control my life, I begin to push away the one who controls, who embraces me, who holds me, and who gives me real life. It is no coincidence that this story occurs in the Gospel of Mark, during a part of that story, part of Mark's Gospel, where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to do what? What's Jesus going to do in Jerusalem? Die. Die on the cross. 
What Jesus offers to that rich young man is life, the fullness of life, provided the guy's ready to let Jesus embrace him rather than him hanging on to what he thinks will give him control and life. But the second thing in this story, we talked about the children's message. The rich young man is doing stuff. What's Jesus doing? Jesus is loving him. Jesus is loving him, loving him all the way to the cross, loving him, loving him, not, not, not condemning him, not threatening him, not saying, boy, if you don't put more, you know, you don't give more money, psh, there you go. Jesus is loving and inviting this rich young man into a new, full, and rich life that is not grounded in what he can hang on to, but is grounded in what God offers him in the person of Jesus. And then the third thing in the story. What happened the next day? Anybody know what happened the next day? I don't know. It's not in there. But I do know. Because what I know is that this story is not really about the rich young man. This story is about me. It's about you too, but I'll focus on me first. It is about me. And so this past Tuesday, in some fashion that I cannot quite put my hand, put a, put my hand on, God said to me that I need to let go of all the things that I'm trying to control in life. All the things that I hang on to because they give me the illusion of being in control. God said, let go of that stuff and let me be in control. And you know what I did? Nothing. So the next day, on Wednesday, God came to me in some fashion and said, I really want you to let go of the stuff in your life and to let me be the one who guides and directs your life. Put your trust and your confidence in what I am doing for you in Jesus. And you know what I did? Nothing. And so on Thursday, God came to me in, a sort of, in some sort of fashion, and God called me to, to, to be embraced by the love of Jesus instead of hanging on to all the stuff that I think gives me life. And you know what I did? Thank you. Nothing. Right? I did nothing. What this story is about is not about this dramatic moment in life where you make one choice or the other, and if you make the wrong choice, well, you're in big trouble. This story is about the flow of discipleship and about the struggle to be faithful to a good and gracious God who has entrusted me with everything to begin with. It's about that ongoing journey in which I do, you know, sometimes I do pretty well and sometimes I fail miserably. And but I keep working at it. And I keep working at it in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the presence of a Jesus who loves me. Who loves me again and again and again. And so I learn, I try at least, to learn to grow in my sense of discipleship and in my sense of stewardship. So that said, the other thing I did on Wednesday is I took a trip over to the Holloman house. Thank you, Jeff. And so Jeff Haldeman, Jeff, I asked Jeff to think a little bit about growing in stewardship. Growing, and, and I want to share the clip with you. Um, Jeff's stuff is great, the camera works not great, just blame that on the cameraman. But not on Jeff, he did a great job. Yeah, it's great. Right. Right. Well, welcome to the uh, Haldeman House. Um, and, and thank you for, for listening. Um, stewardship for us has, has been a changing thing for Melissa and I since uh, we joined the church in 1988. Uh, we were both quite young, 24 and 23 years old, so you can do the math now to see how old we are. But uh, when we started off, we were on a very tight budget. No question about it. We, we, we simply were happy to give up our, ourselves, our time, we had no children at that time, um, and we were, we were, well, this church is blessed because, in, in my opinion, my wife has a beautiful voice. She sings very well. I don't do so well, but I like to work on things, fix things, build things, uh, volunteer for my time. And, and as we've aged, and we're at a different point in our lives, so we've had three children, they are uh, happily, they've grown up and they're now established in their in their jobs and they're no longer living with us every day. Uh, hopefully, that doesn't.
doesn't change anytime soon. <laughs> we, we, our stewardship has changed as we, we've grown in, in this journey through our lives. Uh, we both are blessed with really wonderful jobs that enable us to, uh, have enabled us to, to give more of our, of our money, quite frankly, uh, which, which has helped, we hope it helps all people, uh, members of this church, uh, members of the community, uh, members of the, of the world that are in need of help. So every year when stewardship rolls around in the church calendar, my wife and I, we review it, and, and I have to say, it's my wife, Melissa, who says, I think we can do better. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm actually very happy that she does do that, because she's been right every time, which is a good thing for us guys to say. It, it, it's, it, really, it really is, it has been an important thing, and, and every year that we try to increase, and we do increase, we Everything turns out just fine. We, we don't miss it. We, we're, we're fine. And, and we're, it's a blessing to, to be able to do that for, for the people of the community, the, the people of the church, the people of the world. What, this, this is all a very good thing. And it's, uh, it can be difficult, but it's very rewarding all at the same time. At the end of the day, it's like, yes, we can do that. So as I indicated, we have good jobs. This is, this is, a, this is a part of it. But not only do we have good jobs, we have, we have our faith. We have you know, Jesus in our lives, which what more can one ask for? And, and Jesus calls us to do these things. And, and again, it's an important thing for everyone to be part of something. So finally, I want to thank you for listening, and thank you for being part of our lives. Everyone has been a blessing to us, and we're very thankful for knowing each and every one of you.
Uh, they're going to some Christmas carols, and they're going to play them on the second Wednesday of December, the second Advent service, uh, before worship out in the gathering area. Um, and just kind of do a fun thing with that. Um, these are sixth graders. But maybe next year, they're going to take that elective, and they'll be playing out there. And then maybe a year or two down the road, Linda will um, sweet talk them or, or uh, into playing for Easter. Yeah, you know, playing, playing the instruments for Easter. Maybe somewhere down the road, as, as high school students, they'll go on a mission trip. Or maybe they'll teach Sunday school. And maybe they'll apply for a, a college scholarship and they'll go off to college and someday maybe one of them will be standing right here as the pastor or maybe one of them will be doing a video just like this, like Jeff did. The point is, they are growing in their discipleship and their stewardship and they're growing in their discipleship and their stewardship because we are encouraging and nurturing them and because we are learning and growing and in our stewardship and in our discipleship. And that's what changes the story, I think, of this rich young man from do it or else to the recognition that I don't. And I regularly don't, but I keep working at it. Because I have a loving God and a loving Jesus who continues to offer the promise to me, continues to work in my life, and yeah, I'm going to mess up. I do that a whole lot. I'm good at that. But Jesus loves me. And Jesus cares continues to nurture me to be a faithful disciple because when I am a faithful disciple, when I finally get it and I let go of all the stuff that I'm hanging on to, I discover the wonderful gifts of life that the crucified and the risen Jesus offers. And then I say, oh, why didn't I do this long time? <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff, for your, your words. Thank you to our musicians who unknowingly volunteered of their skills. Appreciate that. One of them's right over here. It's been fun about to be so, um, Remember, Jesus loves you. We continue with hymn number 583 as you are comfortable with your please rise. Thank you. 
all people in need.
in bread and wine you give us gifts that form us to be humble and courageous. May your words come to life at our serving and in our witness, that we might speak a living voice of healing and justice to all the world, through Jesus Christ, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. God, creator of all things, speaking reformation into being, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, raising the dead, Holy Spirit, living voice, calling and enlightening the church, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the announcement. All this last going on, so take your bulletin home and check them out. Um, also, take the breath prayer home and put that on your refrigerator so you're in for that this week. Um, just a couple of things that you can read about. The um, last chance to give your input for the Mission Endowment Fund disbursements. For those of you that have pre K to third grade students, um, Wednesday, October 24th is the Halloween party that the ninth grade confirmation students will be doing, so we invite you to take note of that. The kids should be bringing home something about that um, today. Also note, following the 10.30 worship service on October 28th, which is Reformation Sunday, we will be blessing and dedicating our new prayer labyrinth across the street. So following worship, following this service, we will gather, take the processional cross, and walk across the street and bless the prayer labyrinth. So I invite you to be a part of that um, on the 28th of October. Um, read about coffee and ushering opportunities. That would be super if you to be a part of that. And Pastor John will share about the Norwegian dinner. It is almost Norwegian dinner time. Um, getting ready for the rutabagas and lutefisk and meatballs. I can pass some of the lutefisk and meatballs are to die for. Just let you know. Uh, it is also time as we begin to uh, get people filled in to do the various roles. So as you leave the sanctuary, there's a table. Uh, please sign up to be a part of the Norwegian dinner. Why would you want to do that? Here's some, a lot of you have. Some of you have. Here's why. Last night when we were making this announcement, it occurred to me that a lot of churches do something like this as a fundraiser, you know, kind of beefs up the budget a little bit type of thing. And I thought, well, we don't do it as a fundraiser. And I said, well, yeah, we do, but not for us. I don't know exactly where the money will go this year, but the, this might be a fundraiser for the Warming Center in the Cross. This might be a fundraiser for um, Big Brothers Big Sisters. This might be a fundraiser for um, programs and ministries that feed people in our community. The point is, when we do the Norwegian dinner, we invest in our community and the people around us, in people who are hurting, in people who are in need. So is the Norwegian dinner a lot of work yet? Is, is the Norwegian dinner, you know, if you work at the Norwegian dinner, when you come home that evening and you're tired? Yeah, you probably will, but you will also come home very fulfilled that you have made a difference in the lives of people. That's why we do the Norwegian dinner, because it makes a difference in the lives of people. Um, Inger, would you stand up for a moment? Okay, so a lot of you know Inger, some of you don't. If you want to be a part of the Norwegian dinner, and you walk out and you look at the sign-up sheet, you say, what in the world is that? That's the person to ask you, because she knows all things. Isn't that true, Todd? She knows all things. You say yes, that's right. You say yes, that's right. So you're learning from Jeff, you're learning from Jeff, that's what you said. But seriously, Inger is one of our three um, uh, beautiful ladies, and uh, we'd be out there later, Inger just kind of, so that's the person to go to and say, so what does it mean, what is this particular task in she will let you know. Um, it really is. It really is a lot of fun. I mean, it's just, it is a lot of fun. We we connect with a lot of people. We enjoy doing it. So um, if you haven't done it before, this is the time to do it. And if you have done it before, do it again because because it's great. And um, I confirmed with Lynette Ender, one of the other Ludifus ladies at the early service, the number is correct. We typically disperse about eight thousand dollars. Every penny that we make on the Ludifus dinner, the Norwegian dinner, goes to those community programs. And that's usually around eight thousand dollars. That makes a huge difference in, in our community. So please be a part of that. Sign up and get me blessed. As you are comfortable, would you please rise and join the closing hymn number seven hundred and twenty.
Yeah.